1816. About 10 o'clock, the emperor entered my apartment. He came unawares as he wished to take a walk. I followed him, and he walked for some time towards the wood, where we were taken up by the calash. A considerable interval had elapsed since he made use of it. I was the only person with him, and the bill, which related to him, and with the nature of which we were unacquainted, was during the whole time the subject of our conversation. Upon our return, the emperor, after some hesitation, whether he should breakfast under the trees, determined to go in and remain at home the whole of the day. He dined alone. He sent for me after dinner. I found him engaged in reading some Mercuries or old journals. They supplied various anecdotes and circumstances respecting Beaumarchais, whom the emperor during his consulate had notwithstanding all his wit uniformly discountenanced on account of his bad character and his gross immorality. The difference of manners imparted a poignancy to the anecdotes, although the difference of times was so trifling. He found an account of Louis the Sixteenth's visit to Cherbourg, on which he dwelt for some time. He next adverted to the works of Cherbourg and took a rapid review of them with the clearness, precision, and lively manner that characterized everything he said. Cherbourg is situated at the bottom of a semicircular bay, the two extremities of which are the Isle of Pelai on the right and the point Kerkaville on the left, the line by which these two points are connected form the cord or the diameter that runs east and west opposite to the north and at a very small distance, about 20 leagues, is the celebrated Portsmouth, the grand arsenal of the English. The remainder of their coast runs nearly parallel, opposite to ours. Nature has done everything for our rivals, nothing for us. Their shores are safe and every day freed from obstruction. They abound in good soundings in the means of shelter and harbors and excellent ports. Ours are, on the contrary, filled with rocks. Their water is shallow, and they are every day choking up. We have not in these parts a single real port of large dimensions, and it might be said that the English are, at the same time, both at home and on our coast, since it is not requisite for their squadrons at anchor in Portsmouth to put to sea to molest us. A few light vessels are sufficient to convey intelligence of our movements, and in an instant, without trouble and danger, they are ready to seize upon their prey. If, on the contrary, our squadrons are daring enough to appear in the British Channel, which ought in reality to be called the French Sea only, they are exposed to perpetual danger. Their total destruction may be affected by the hurricanes or the enemy's superiority, because in both these cases, there is no shelter for them. This is what happened at the famous Battle of La Hogue, where Tourville might have been enabled to ignite the glory of a skillful retreat with that of a hard-fought and so an equal contest had there been a port for him to take shelter in. In that state of things, men of great sagacity and attached to the good of their country prevailed upon government by dint of projects and memorials to seek by the systems of art for those resources of which we have been deprived by nature. And after a great deal of hesitation, the Bay of Cherbourg was selected and was to be suited to the design by the means of an immense dike projected into the sea. In that way, we were to acquire even close to the enemy an artificial road whence our ships might be enabled in all times and weather to attack his and where they might escape from their pursuit. It was, said the emperor, magnificent and glorious undertaking, very difficult with respect to the execution and to the finances of that period. The dike was to be formed by immense cones constructed empty in the port and towed afterwards to the spot where they were sunk by the weight of the stones with which they were filled. There certainly was great ingenuity in the invention. Louis the Sixteenth honored those operations with his presence. His departure from Versailles was a great event. In those times, the king never left his residence. His excursions did not extend beyond the limits of a hunting party. They did not hurry about as at present. And I really believe that I contributed not a little to the rapidity of their movements. However, as it was absolutely necessary, the thing should be impressed with the character, the age, the eternal rivalry between the land and the sea. That question, which can never be decided, continued to be carried on 
it might have been said in that respect that there were two kings in France, or that he who reigned had two interests and ought to have two wills, which proved rather that he had none at all. Here the sea was the only subject for consideration, yet the question was decided in favor of the land, not by the superiority of argument, but by the priority of right, where the fate of the empire was at stake, a point of precedence was substituted, and thus the grand object, the magnificent enterprise, failed to success. The land party established itself at the Isle of Pile and at Fort Caracaville. It was employed there merely to lend an auxiliary hand to the construction of the dike, which was itself the chief object. But instead of that, it began by establishing its own predominance and afterwards compelled the dike to become the instrument of its convenience and subservient to its plans and discretion. What was the result? The harbor that was forming and which ought to contain the mass of our navy, whether designed to strike at the heart of the enemy's power or to take occasional shelter, could only accommodate 15 sail at most, while we wanted anchorage for more than a hundred, which might have been effected without more labor, and with little more expense had the works been carried more forward into the sea merely beyond the limits which the land party had appropriated to itself. Another blunder, highly characteristic and scarcely conceivable, took place. All the principal measures for completing the harbor were fixed upon the dike commenced one of the channels. That to the eastward finished and the other to the westward was on the point of being formed without an exact and precise knowledge of all the soundings. This oversight was so great that the channel already formed that to the eastward 500 fathoms broad, having been extended too closely to the fort, did not without inconvenience admit of vessels at low water, and that the other, which was about to be constructed to the westward, would have been impracticable, or at least very dangerous, but for the individual zeal of one officer, Monsieur de Chavignac, who made that important discovery in time and caused the works on the left extremity of the dike to be stopped at the distance of 1,200 fathoms from Caracaville Fort, by which it was to be defended the seems to me and is in fact too great a distance. The system adopted in the works of the dike, which is more than a league from the shore and more than 1,900 fathoms long by 90 feet broad, was also liable to numerous changes suggested, however, by experience. The cones, which according to the established principle, ought to have touched each other in their bases, were in that respect either separated by accident or with the view of economy, they were damaged by storms eaten by worms, or they rotted with age. They were at length altogether neglected, with the exception of stones thrown at random into the sea. And when it was observed that these were scattered by the rolling of the waves, recourse had to enormous blocks, which finally answered every expectation. The works were continued without interruption under Louis the Sixteenth, and increased degree of activity was imparted to them by our legislative assemblies. But in consequence of the commotions which soon followed, Followed, they were completely abandoned, and at that time of the consulate, there was not a trace of that famous dike to be seen. Everything had been destroyed for several feet under low water level by the original imperfection of the plan, by the length of time, and the violence of the waves. The moment, however, I took the helm of affairs, one of my first employments was to turn my attention to so important a point. I ordered commissions of inquiry. I had the subject discussed in my presence. I made myself acquainted with the local circumstances, and I decided that the dike should be run up with all possible means and expedition in that two solid fortifications should in the course of time be constructed at the two extremities, but that measures should be immediately taken for the establishment of a considerable provisional battery. I had then to encounter on all sides the inconveniences, the objections, the particular views of fondness which attaches itself to individual opinions. Several maintain that the thing certainly could not be done. I continued steady, I insisted, I commanded, and the thing was done. In less than two years, a real island was seen to rise as a it were by magic from the sea on which was erected a battery of large caliber. Until that moment, our labors had almost constantly been the sport of the English. They had, they said, been con convinced from their origin that they would prove fruitless. They had foretold that their cones would destroy themselves, that the small stones would be swept away by the waves. And above all, they relied upon our lassitude and our inconstancy.
But here things were completely altered and they made a show of molesting our operations. They were, however, too late. I was very prepared for them. The Western Channel naturally continued very wide and the two extreme fortifications which defended each its peculiar passage. Being incapable of maintaining a crossfire, it was probable that an enterprising enemy might be enabled to force the Western Channel come himself to an anchor within the dike and there renew the defeat of Abu Kir, but I had already guarded against this with my central provisional battery. However, as I am for permanent establishments, I ordered within the dike in the center by way of support, and which in its turn might serve as an envelope, an enormous elliptical pie to be constructed, commanding the central battery, and mounted itself into casemated tiers bomb proof with 50 pieces of large caliber and 20 mortars of an extensive range as well as barracks powder magazine cistern i have the satisfaction of having left this noble work in a finished state having provided for the defense of my only business was to prepare offensive measures which consisted in the means of collecting the mass of our fleets at cherbourg the harbor however could contain but 15 sail for the purpose of increasing the number i caused a new port to be dug the romans never undertook a more important a more difficult task or one which promised a more lasting duration it was sunk into the granite to the depth of 50 feet and i caused opening of it to be celebrated by the presence of Maria Luisa while I myself was on the fields of battle in Saxony. By this means, I procured anchorage for 25 sail more. Still, that number was not sufficient, and I therefore relied upon very different means of augmenting my naval strength. I was resolved to renew the wonders of Egypt at Cherbourg. I had already erected my pyramid in the sea. I would have also had my Lake Murris. My great object was to be enabled to concentrate all their maritime force, and in time, it would have been immense and adequate to strike a fatal blow against the enemy. I was preparing my scene of action in such a way that the two nations in their totality might have been enabled to grapple with each other man to man, and the issue could not be doubtful, for we would have been more than 40 millions of French against 15 millions of English. I should have wound up the war with the Battle of Actium, and afterwards... What did I want of England? Her destruction? Certainly not. I merely wanted the end of an intolerable usurpation, the enjoyment of imprescriptible and sacred rights, the deliverance, the liberty of the seas, the independence, the honor of flags. I was speaking in the name of all and for all, and I should have succeeded by concession or by force. I had on my side power, indisputable right, the wishes of nations. I have reasons for believing that the emperor, disgusted with the losses occasioned by partial attempts at sea and enlightened by fatal experience, had adopted a new system of maritime war. The war between England and France had insensibly assumed the aspect of a real struggle for life or death. The irritation of all the English against Napoleon was raised to the highest degree. His Berlin and Milan decrees, his continental system and offensive expressions had shocked all minds on the other side of the channel, while the ministers, by their libels, fabrications, and all imaginable means, had succeeded in exciting every passion to render the quarrel altogether national on this ground. It was declared in full parliament that the war was perpetually released for life. The emperor thought it his duty to shape his plans in conformity to that state of things. And from that instant, as much from calculation as from necessity, he gave up all kind of cruising, distant enterprises, and hazardous attempts. He determined upon a strict defensive system until his continental affairs should be finally settled and the accumulation of his maritime forts should allow him to strike with certainty at a later period. He therefore retained the whole of his shipping and and confine himself to the gradual augmentation of our naval resources without exposing them to any further risk. Everything was calculated on the basis of a remote result. Our Navy had lost a great number of vessels. The greatest part of our good seamen were prisoners in England, and all our ports were blockaded by the English, who straightened their communications. The Emperor ordered canals to be constructed in Brittany, by the means of which, and in spite of the enemy, points of communication for providing breast with all kinds of supplies were established between Bordeaux, Rochefort, Nantes, 
Holland adds for Sherbrooke and that port. He was desirous of having wet docks at Flushing or in its neighborhood for the purpose of containing the Antwerp squadron, completely equipped and ready to put to sea in 420 hours, which was necessarily confined in the Scheldt four or five months of the year. Finally, he projected near Bologna or on some spot along that coast, the construction of a dike similar to that of Cherbourg and a harbor between Cherbourg and Brass suitable to the Isle of Bois. All this was planned for the purpose of securing at all times without danger of full and free communication to our ships from Antwerp as far as Brest to obviate the want of seamen and the great difficulty of forming them. It was ordered that the young conscripts should be every day trained in all our ports. They were at first to be put on board of small light vessels and a flotilla of that kind was even to navigate the Zwieder Zee. They were afterwards to be turned over to large ships and immediately replaced by others of the same class. The vessels were ordered to get under sail every day, to go through every possible maneuver and evolution, and even to exchange shots with the enemy without exposing themselves to the chance of an engagement. The last point was the force and number of our vessels. They were considerable, notwithstanding all their losses, and the emperor calculated on being enabled to build 20 or 25 yearly. The crews would be ready as fast as they were wanted, and thus, at the expiration of four or six years. He could have relied upon having 200 sail of the line and perhaps 300 had that never been necessary in less than 10 years. And what was that period of time with regard to the perpetual or the war for life which was declared against us? The affairs of the continent would in the meantime be brought to a termination. The whole of it would have embraced our system. The emperor would have marched back the greatest part of his troops to our coast and it was in that situation that he looked with confidence to a decisive issue of the contest. All the respective resources of the two nations would have been called into action, and we should then, in his opinion, subdue our enemies by moral energy or strangle them by our natural strength. The emperor entertained several projects for the improvement of the navy and adapted to that, and part of his military tactics, he intended to establish his offensive and defensive line from Cape Finisterre to the mouths of the Elba. He was to have had three squadrons with admirals commanding in chief, and he had corps d'armee with their generals in chief. The admiral of the center was to establish his headquarters at Cherbourg, of the left at Brest, and of the right at Antwerp. Smaller divisions were to be stationed at the extremities at Rochefort and at Ferrol in the Texel and at the mouths of the Elba for the purpose of turning and outflanking the enemy. All these points were to be connected by numerous intermediate stations and their respective commanders-in-chief were to be considered as constantly present by the assistance of telegraphs, which lining the coast preserved an uninterrupted communication between the parts of the grand system. Let us consider, however, what would have been the conduct of the English during our preparations and the progressive increase of our naval power. Would they have continued the blockade of our ports, we should have had the satisfaction of witnessing the wear and tear of their cruising squadrons. We should have compelled them to maintain 100 or 150 vessels constantly exposed on our coasts to the violence of tempests, to the danger of rocks, to all the hazards of disaster, while we, on the contrary, had every chance of success should any unforeseen catastrophe present itself from natural events or the fault of their admirals, which could not fail to happen in the course of time. What advantages should we not have derived from it? the event? We, fresh and in excellent condition, we who waited for the opportunity, always ready to sail and engage should the English be tired out, our vessels would immediately put to sea for the purpose of exercising and trading their crews on the completion of our armaments and at the approach of the decisive moment where the English, frightened for the safety of their island, to collect their strength in front of their principal arsenals, Plymouth, Portsmouth, and the Thames, or three divisions of Brest, Cherbourg, and Antwerp would attack them, and our wings would turn then on the side of Ireland and Scotland, 
were they relying upon their skill and bravery resolve to oppose us in one great body, then the struggle would be reduced to a decisive issue of which we should have been at liberty to choose the time, the place, and the opportunity. And this is what the emperor called the Battle of Actium, in which if we were defeated, we experienced but simple losses, while if we prove victorious, the enemy ceased to exist. But our triumph he maintained with certain, for the two nations would have to contend man to man, and we were upwards of 40 millions against 15. This was the favorite position on which he uniformly dwelt. Such was one of his grand ideas, his gigantic conceptions. Napoleon had been the founder of so many establishments that his works and monuments are injurious to each other by their number, variety, and importance. It was my earnest wish to have given a full relation of his works, which were executed at Cherbourg, as well as those of which he had projected a person precisely of the profession best qualified to appreciate the subject and one of its brightest ornaments has promised me a description of them. Should he keep his word, it will be found in the following volume. The 16th, about 9 o'clock, the emperor took an airing in the calash. There was a vessel in sight at which he looked through the glass. He invited the doctor, whom he found employed, in the same way to accompany him. On our return, we breakfasted under the trees. He conversed at great length with the doctor, respecting the governor's conduct towards us, his endless vexations. About two o'clock, the message was brought to the emperor to ascertain whether he was willing to receive the governor. He gave him an audience that lasted nearly two hours and ran over without falling into a passion. He said all the objects under discussion. He recapitulated all their grievances, enumerated all his wrongs, addressed himself, he observed by turns to his understanding, his imagination, his feelings, and his heart. He put it in his power to repair all the mischief he had done to recommence upon a plan altogether new, but in vain for that man he declared was without fiber. Nothing was to be expected from him. This governor said the emperor had assured him that when the detention of Mr. de Montalon's servant took place, he did not know he was in our service, and he added that he had not read Madame Bertrand's sealed letter. The emperor observed to him that his letter to Count Bertrand was altogether repugnant to our manners and in direct opposition to our prepossessions, that if ye, the emperor, were but a simple general and private individual, and had received such a letter from him, the governor, he would have called him out. That a man so well known and respected in Europe as the Grand Marshal was not to be insulted under the penalty of social reprobation, that he did not take a correct view of his situation with regard to us, that all his actions here came within the province of history, and that even the conversation which passed at that moment belonged to history, that he injured every day by his conduct, his own government, and his own nation, and that in time he might feel the consequences of it, that his government would disclaim his conduct in the end, and that a stain would attach itself to his name, which would disgrace his children. Will you allow me, said the emperor, to tell you what we think of you? We think you capable of everything, yes, of everything, and while you retain your hand Hatred, we shall retain our opinion. I shall still wait for some time because I like to act upon certainties and I shall then have to complain, not that the worst proceeding of ministers was to send me to St. Helena, but that they gave you the command of it. You are a greater calamity to us than all the wretchedness of this horrible rock. The governor's answer to all this was that he was about to transmit an account of it to his government, that he learned at least something from the emperor, but that he received only provoking treatment from us, and that we made matters worse. With respect to the commissioners of the powers whom the governor wished to present, the emperor rejected them in their political capacity, but assured the governor that he would readily receive them as private individuals, that he had no dislike to any one of them, not even to the French commissioner, Monsieur de Montchenu, who might be a very worthy man, who had been his subject ten years and have been an emigrant, was probably indebted to him, the emperor, for the happiness of returning to France, that besides, after all, he was a Frenchman, that 
That title was indelible in his eyes that there was no opinion which could destroy it in his estimation. With regard to the new buildings at Longwood, which were the great object of the governor's visit, the emperor replied to his communication on that topic that he did not wish for them, that he preferred his present inconvenient residences to a better one situated at a great distance and at the expense of a great deal of noise and the trouble of moving, that the buildings which he had just mentioned to him required years to be completed and that before that time either we should not be worth the cost incurred for us or providence would have delivered him from us the 17th the emperor sent for me about two o'clock he dressed himself and went out in the calash madame de montalon was one of the party it was her first appearance in her accouchement the conversation turned particularly on the Italian ladies, their character and beauty. The young general who effected the conquest of Italy excited in that country from the first moment every feeling of enthusiasm and ambition. The emperor was delighted in acknowledging and telling it. Above all, there was not a beauty who did not aspire to please and touch his heart, but in vain. His mind, he said, was too strong to be caught in the snare. The precipice concealed under the flowers was present to his view. His situation was singularly delicate. He had the command of veteran generals. The task he had to execute, he observed, was immense. All his motions were watched by jealous eyes. His circumspection was extreme. His fortune consisted in his prudence. He might have forgotten himself for a few single hour and how many of his victories said he had been connected with a point of no superior importance several years afterwards at the time of his coronation at milan his attention was attracted by grassini the celebrated singer circumstances were then more auspicious he desired to see her and immediately after her introduction she put him in mind and she had made her debut precisely during the early achievements of the general of the army of italy ah was then, said she, in the full luster of my beauty and my talent, my performance in The Virgins of the Sun was a topic of universal conversation. I fascinated every eye and inflamed every heart. The young general alone was insensible to my charms, and yet he was the only object of my wishes. What caprice, what singularity, when I possessed some value, when all Italy was at my feet, and I heroically disdained its admiration for a single glance from you, I was unable to obtain it. And now how strange an alteration you condescend to notice me now when I'm not worth the trouble and no longer worthy of you. The celebrated Madame V was also among the crowd of Armidas, but tired with losing her time, she lowered her pretensions to Bertier, who from the first instant lived but for her. The commander-in-chief made him a present one day of a magnificent diamond worth more than 100,000 francs. Here, said he, take that. We often pay high, lay it up against a rainy day. Four and twenty hours had scarcely elapsed when Madame Bonaparte came to tell her husband of a diamond which was the subject of her admiration. It was the present that was to have been laid up against a rainy day which had already found its way from Berthier's hand to Madame V's head. He has since, in all the circumstances of his life, been uniformly governed by her. The emperor, having gradually heaped riches and honors upon Bertier, pressed him often to marry, but he has constantly refused, declaring that Madame V could alone make him happy. The son, however, of Madame V, having got acquainted with the Duchess of Bavaria, who had come to Paris with the hope of obtaining a husband through the emperor's favor, Madame V thought she was doing wonders in advancing her son's fortune by the marriage of her lover, and with this impression she prevailed upon Bertier to espouse a Bavarian princess, but said the emperor, there is no project, however excellent, which does not become the sport of fortune, for scarcely was the marriage concluded when Madame V's husband died and left his wife at liberty. That event proved to her and to Bertier the source of real despair. They were inconsolable. Bertier came with tears in his eyes to communicate his wretched fate to the emperor, who laughed at his misfortune. To what a miserable condition he exclaimed was he reduced. With a little more constancy, Madame V might have been his wife. 18th, about four o'clock, I was sent for by the emperor, who was in a very weak state. He had, by an absence of mind, remained three hours in a very hot bath and burned his right thigh 
with the boiling water. He had read two volumes in the bath. He shaved, but would not dress himself. At half past seven, the emperor ordered two covers to be laid in his cabinet. It was very much out of temper, because his papers were thrown into confusion by using the table on which they lay. They were replaced by his direction, and the covers laid upon another small table. We conversed for a long time. He brought me back to topics which often suggested themselves to him when we were together, and upon which I must endeavor not to be guilty of repetitions, the more so as they possess attractions which to me are peculiarly interesting. We talked a great deal about our youthful years and the time we passed at the military school. This subject led him to notice the new schools he'd established at Saint-Cyr and at Saint-Germain, and he finally recurred to the emigrants and those he called nos incrutes. He became gay and lively in consequence of some anecdotes of the Falberg censure man respecting his person, which I related, and as the slightest things grew into importance, the moment he touched upon them, he said, I see plainly that my plan with respect to your Falberg censure man was ill-managed. I did too much, too little. I did not do enough to satisfy the opposite party and not enough to connect the other with me altogether. Although some of them were fond of money, the multitude would have been content with the rattles and sounds with which I could could have crammed them without any injury into the main to our new principles, my dearest causes. I did too much and not enough, and yet I was earnestly occupied with the business. Unfortunately, I was the only one seriously engaged in the undertaking. All who were about me thwarted instead of promoting it, and yet there were but two grand measures to be taken with regard to you, that of annihilating or that of melting you down into the great mass of society. The former could not enter my head, and the latter was not an easy task, but I did not consider it beyond my strength, and in fact, although I had no support and was even counteracted in my views, I nearly realized them at length. Had I remained, the thing would have been accomplished. This will appear astonishing to him who knows how to appreciate the heart of man and the state of society. I do not think that history can furnish any case of a similar kind or that so important a result can obtain in so short a space that time can be found. I should have carried that fusion into effect and cemented that union by every sacrifice. It would have rendered us invincible. The opposite conduct has ruined us and made for a long time protract misfortunes, perhaps the last gasps of unhappy France. I once more repeat that I did too much or too little. I ought to have attached the emigrants to me upon their return. I might have easily become an object of adoration with the aristocracy and establishment of that nature was necessary for me. It is the real, the only support of monarchy, its guide, its lever. Its point of resistance without it, the state is but a vessel without a rudder, a real balloon in the air, but the essence of aristocracy, its talismanic charm, consists in antiquity, in age, and these are the only things I could not create. The intermediate means were wanting. Monsieur de Bretoya, who had insinuated himself into my favor, encouraged me. On the contrary, Monsieur de T., who certainly was not a favorite with the emigrants, discouraged me by every possible means. Reasonable democracy contents itself with husbanding equality for all as a fair ground of protection and possession. The real line of conduct would have been to employ the remains of aristocracy together with the forms and design of democracy. Above all, it was necessary to collect the ancient names of celebrating our history. This is the only mode of giving an instantaneous air of old age to the most modern institutions.